I'm trying to. How you doing today? I'm making it. And we can do the same thing. Is that a good sure our children are okay? No, I don't know. The way I write, it looks like <laughs> I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a parking permit for that in here? I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I do have a six months. Six months? Oh, wow. Okay, you're proud of uniform. You're missing your frogs. Ribbit, ribbit, you know, for the bell. I was so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so much pain when I got my last time. I just went to the board. 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 I Marcus, one of those chairs will flip over, so be careful. I'm not sure which one it is, but I don't know. Yeah, don't. It's not funny. I can go call them workers' comp. It wouldn't be funny. Okay. Um, That's just not okay, right? I think you got the chair, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> There's two. No two are going to be here. Truman's not here. Who else? Is that, is that testing? We're doing something. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the workshop this evening, Griffin Board of Commissioners, May 24, 2022. It is our annual fiscal year 2022 2023 budget presentation. So, this is O'Connor and her team. So welcome, everybody. Yeah, we have a good crowd today of all directors. <laughs> all right. You ready? Ready roll. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, as usual, I first need to thank all of those that are sitting in this room behind me. Uh, it's been a difficult year, a difficult budget for many reasons, but most specifically, I think just the economic climate that we're all in, that we're all uh, having a challenging time navigating through. So it was not an easy budget. And then to add to that, we changed our software for the first time in ever. Um, so we had to go through, um, we had to go through and figure out new software along with a complicated budget. So it's been, um, I'll say maybe a rough couple months uh, and we're still actually sort of trying to figure out how all of it works. So hopefully we don't miss anything today. 
but I'm sure if we do that, Mr. Schwab or Ms. Thompson can, can correct me. Um, especially thanks to them, I don't, we certainly wouldn't have a balanced budget had they not worked so closely with me to make sure um, that we can make this balanced and fair. Uh, and then also I'd like to thank Ms. Bartholomew and Ms. Tremel because they sort of kept everybody at bay and away from me and got them where they needed to go and still get help without having to bother me the last month or so and that was very helpful. Uh, with that said, let's move on to the budget presentation. The first thing that we need to make note of is that this has been posted in the Griffin Daily News on May 11, 2022, where we advertise for two public hearings on the budget. One is for this evening at 6 p.m. in this room, and then another one on June 14th at 6 p.m. If we have some big changes that need to take place after today's discussion, then we can, of course, postpone that. Um, or if we just have a couple of changes between tonight's public hearing and the 14th, then we can go ahead and move forward with that. Uh, the ad also included the date of the vote as being on June 14th for the adoption of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023 capital and operating budgets. It has been available in my office since Friday, May 13th, and it has also been on the city's website. We have not had a citizen come in the office to review the budget, and I was hoping to figure out how many visitors have actually clicked on that budget link on the website, but we couldn't quite figure that out at this time, so I'm not sure how many have actually visited the website. Again, I do believe that this shows a fair and balanced budget. Uh, although I have noted in the budget summary that there are a few areas that we may have to reconsider later in this calendar year, um, just because of the high fluctuations in costs, supplies, personnel, those kind of things. And I think you'll notice as we go throughout uh, the budget this morning, there is a common theme. We do have some increase in revenue, but unfortunately our expenses increase just as much if not more. So our operating supplies, our tools, our capital, vehicle, personnel costs, all of that went up, and we'll talk about that in a little more specifics next. Right. Sorry, I'm trying to get this volume off. Cody, can you come turn this volume off? I don't know why it keeps going PowerPoint. we always try and balance based or balance our budget based on our goals so as you remember i hope that at our annual goals workshop in january we went through five different goals from both the board of commissioners as well as the staff and most of them are pretty similar um, as always on those substandard housing blight trash litter and junk downtown redevelopment crime reduction and a compensation study for this year so with those areas of importance in mind we looked at our budget this year our department directors prioritized those goals and we came up with the following budget. This year, our overall revenues exceed expenditures by 1,354,378. That's actually an increase from last year. So we're doing a little bit better there. Last year's was 1.29. Our general fund expenditures exceed revenues by 9,079,844. Unfortunately, those expenditures and their excess actually increased as well from FY22 when it was a little less than 9 million. Our total general fund revenue is up $3,249,433. That is without transfers. And last year it was up 2,448,000. So again, another pretty substantial increase in revenue for our general fund. That's made up with real and personal property tax is up about 55,000. Motor vehicle tax and the TABT increase of about 143,000. And we have budgeted a $475,000 increase in our local option sales tax. Our property tax for fiscal year 22 year to date, we've collected 4.66 million. Those numbers also include our TADs and our TIPs. So that's not just real and personal property, but all of that as well. In 21, we collected 4.36, and in 20, we were at 3.74. So we have seen an increase in property tax collection. We do not know what the digest will look like this year yet, but I have been told as of last Friday that the county and the tax assessor are working on that, so we should have, hopefully, an estimate um, in the next couple weeks. Our TABT projection overall this year is 800,000. FY21 total was 78234, and year-to-date, we're at 522627. 
Our loss projection total is at 5.225 million. Proposed for FY22 is 4.75. And as of today, we've collected 81.32%, which is $3.862 million. And FY21, we find we finished out at 5.025. So we think that that projection is um, a conservative projection, but something that we will certainly hit. Some of our increase in total revenues is based on our ARPA recovery funds, our two slots proceeds, and some of those increases that we just talked about. So although it looks like a huge increase, it's really not quite this year. The other thing in general fund that has increased is our licenses and permits are up 24,000, our fines and forfeitures are up 482,000, and our insurance premium tax is up 134,000. So our total general fund revenue is up 3.249, and that again is without transfers. However, our expenses are also up 3.335 in the general fund, so we're still not making up for those um, increases in revenue. One of the things to mention in the fines and forfeitures, of course, is our school safety cameras. That's what is the big increase there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about adding sessions for those kind of things. Also, as of March 31, our total general fund revenue is at 85% through 75% of the year. So that is also good news. Our total budget all funds projected revenues are up $16.54 million. But again, projected expenses are up 19.185 from our original FY22 projections. Without the TSLA, CDBG, and ARPA, our projected expenses are still up almost $10 million. That's a lot of money. Um, our expenses, when you break that down, increased in the following ways. Electric is 2.295. Water wastewater is 3.227. Solid waste is at 1.466 million. Stormwater actually decreased in expenses of about $227,453, which ironically, they increased almost that exact same amount last year. And then telecom increased 304,101. Their increase in FY22 was 429, 729. So again, the more that we put out there in operating supplies and trying to gain customers, the more that, that costs us as well. Our capital requests this year are $14,141,899. And FY22 was 8,077,728. dollars of those, you have 1.473 million for CDBG, 3,727,500 for TSLOS. ARPA recovery funds are budgeted at 4.995. Our line maintenance improvements that we have every year, we budget for 400,000. We've had 300,000 in new customer construction for electric. Public Works has been sort of short capital the last several years, so they have a wheel loader budgeted at 191.5 and a tandem axle dump truck at $205,000. Our general fund capital total this year is $1,389,025. Last year, our general fund capital was at $361,700. So you see a big difference there. About a million of that is in public works. Um, They really sort of cut budgets last year, the directors did, in trying to get that 2% raise for employees. So we're having to make that up this year um, in that capital. So without um, CDBG, TSPLAST, and ARPA, our capital totals are actually $3.945 million, which is down almost $4 million from FY22. So the, a lot of the utilities don't have quite the capital they did last year, even though our general fund is up. All right, personnel. We have again been able to budget a 2% increase. If you'll remember, this is a little different than we've done in the past. Not every employee is guaranteed a 2% increase. What this does is budget 2% for each department, and then based on evaluations throughout the year, they are given a raise dependent upon how those evaluations come out. So last year, I think our range was either zero if you did not actually meet your expectations. If you needed improvements, you were not eligible for a raise, but if you met expectations, you exceeded most or you exceeded all, you got a percentage of a 2% raise, and so some people actually got more than 2% based on what that um, number was, and that amount was determined citywide, so a department didn't get to decide how many people got the 3% or how many people got the 2%. That was done once we were able to calculate that total amount of money that we were going to be able to give. So we're asking to do that the same way this year. I will go ahead and note though that this does not include anything in regards to our compensation study. Ms. Woods and I met with um, that consultant yesterday afternoon. Timing-wise, it didn't give us the opportunity to be able to put that within this budget, but we are looking at possibly $1.3 million that we are short. As y'all know, that's almost three mils of tax. 
So we're going to have to figure out what to do there. 2% is a great start, but a lot of these positions are 5, 6, 8, 10% below the minimum in our market. And market in this study was not really private companies, um, with the exception of electric and water. It was more our cities that are around us and that are similar in demographic and in size. So we'll have to look at that. One of the other things that we'll need to look at that we have realized is a problem is overtime. I think that is because of all of our vacancies. So in FY 2020, we paid $681,297 in overtime. In 2021, that jumped up drastically to $858,010. In 22 to date, we have paid $944,573. So we have a million dollar problem right there in overtime where if we go ahead and try and get some of these salaries competitive, we can fill some vacant positions and not have to pay all this overtime. We've budgeted for FY23, $872,665. You can see the increase as we've gone on throughout the year. I also know with COVID, with other things that have been going on, it's not just because of salaries, but that is something that we have looked at and tried to make sure that we are controlling better uh, for next fiscal year. Other highlights from personnel, we broke it up by general fund and enterprise fund. First, in general fund and management services, we have reclassed the administrative coordinator position to an executive assistant. This is based on the ongoing and expanding role that um, Ms. Trainel has in my office, the open records requests, the different um, things that she is helping me with now. So Ms. Bartholomew, although not being reclassed in um, grade, is being retitled to a senior executive assistant, also trying to get away with some of the secretary nomenclature that is a little an an antiquated at this point. In DOAS, we have reestablished the account at one position. We're funding that for half the year starting January 1. If you'll remember last year, we came to you and said that we will not need that position anymore because of OpenGov and the implementation of that software it would actually lessen some of the burden in accounting. But what we found out is that's really not the case. It may have increased it a little bit. And then also with the new reporting requirements that we have with the American Rescue Plan Act, um, they need a little bit of help in that department. So we're going to fund that again starting January 1. In IT, uh, they have reclassed a systems administrator to cybersecurity administrator. I think that's just sort of self-explanatory at this point in the kind of climate that we're living in. Um, so that person will actually concentrate mostly on cybersecurity. And then the senior systems administrator is actually going to be reclassed to an IT manager. So you'll now have in that structure, uh, you'll have Mr. Cotton as the chief technology officer, the IT manager and the telecom manager, which we did last year, will both report to him to try and sort of separate those um, general fund and enterprise fund positions a little bit more, but also still create, create some hierarchy within that department. Fire, we are reclassifying a lieutenant to a lieutenant and EMS coordinator. Again, there's a common theme between public safety that there's a lot of training requirements that are being um, increased. And so at this point, based on the amount of calls that we get for medical, uh, we do feel like having an EMS coordinator will be helpful in the fire department. And then police is reclassifying a vacant patrol officer to a training sergeant. So that person will be in charge of not just training, but coordinating all of the training that is now required to keep our certifications intact. Public works, we have added a public works operations manager um, in order to sort of make this as, as easy as possible and keep the number of positions within that department as a whole. We've unfunded the administrative assistant for motor pool. Um, in personnel, we actually have um, a, a person that started, I don't know, a couple months ago, Kelvin's here, and she has really just outshone what we thought we would need in motor pools. We've moved her as an admin coordinator to the entire public works department. Unfortunately, she's not at motor pool, but she has the ability to handle that entire department and doesn't just need a position for motor pool. So we worked well with Mr. Hopper to get that sort of changed over. So you have the same number of positions, just um, in a little bit different fashion at that point. For our enterprise funds in telecom, we've added two employees since we're doing our fiber expansion now. Um, we have a systems engineer that would be budgeted to start July 1 and a support specialist that would start at January 1 or funded starting January 1. The systems engineer is to help sort of build everything out. Um, and then the support specialist is, of course, once it's built out, if there's any kind of troubleshooting problems, then that person would be able to go out and help there. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Sprayberry can't do it all by himself at this point because we're adding more customers almost monthly. So those two employees are needed. Solid waste, as you all know, I think we had our short some drivers, so we're falling a little bit behind on our um, 
our routes. So we're adding a swing driver. We have one currently that sits in the director's department that gives him the ability to say, go work in commercial today, go work at the landfill today. So we're adding a second person for that. It's not designed or not specified for any particular division, but we'll report to Mr. Ennis and he can sort of make sure throughout the week that that schedule is where we need him to be if somebody's on vacation or something along those lines. Watershed management probably has our most changes, as you already know. We have eliminated the deputy director position with the promotion of Mr. Lewis, now as director of watershed management. And instead of the deputy director position, we've added two operations managers. Their workload these days, what they have to do with their uh, sludge drying, and then what is required now from EPA and our water quality really needs more than one person trying to handle that. So we will have an operations manager for water, and we're proposing an operations man manager for wastewater. We've also added a GIS technician in that department to help with the workload and mapping and inventorying those kind of systems. And finally, we realized that stormwater really has become its own beast. And so we have um, sort of taken that out of watershed management and asked Mr. Martin if he will become a director for us. So we'll have watershed management and stormwater as separate departments. Um, and reclass him from a deputy director to a director. Any questions so far about personnel changes? Okay. Oh, I did have one question. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, I can't remember. It was in the finance department, the one that was funded for half a year. Is that a full time or part time? That is a full time position. We're just not starting it until January 1. Okay. Yes, all of those are full time. I don't, I didn't make any really notes on part time. I don't think much changed part time. Okay. All right, insurance is a big change this year as well. Um, as y'all probably remember, last year we changed uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield to Cigna. Unfortunately, Cigna increased our rate by about 25% which we could not do. We knew last year that that was going to happen. So it sort of gave us the year to prepare because we are now suggesting that we go self-insured. Um, that will be with Aetna Maritain. So there's no insurance increase for employees this year. We have done that every single year. We've been able to absorb the insurance increase with the exception of fiscal year 2021. And so this increase is 2.12%, which is a little over $80,000. So the city is going to absorb that cost and not pass it along. There will still be a $1,500 deductible and your same out-of-pocket cost. So there are some changes that will be made, especially if you have a high cost um, prescription or some other kind of high claim. We're actually going through open enrollment right now. So we had um, educational seminars last week with our MSI benefits coordinator, who's our broker. He was able to sit down with those employees that came and explain to them what that change means, but that will become effective July 1. And we think from here on out, a lot better able to manage sort of what those increases are going to be. They're not gonna hit you again for 25%. Um, it's normally more a two, three, almost cost of living type increase instead. So. Although it makes us a little nervous to try and manage that for the first year, I do think that as far as budget and finances are concerned, it's going to be the best for us. I think Mr. Schwab has already talked with some other cities that have moved to that um, and sort of working out sort of cash flow and how that will go for him. So um, it will be a change, but we do think it will be in the best benefit for everyone. The other parts of our insurance. Can you um, sorry, just for my better understanding on, on self-insuring? So we have a company that's a partner with us. Yes. We end up handling everything internally. Right. Do you want to sort of, sorry, talk about that a little bit more? Let me let me take it to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Maritain is a, um, a TPA for Aetna. And so what happens with self-insured where you, we pay the funds, I'm sorry, we pay the claims as the claims come in. So we're currently fully insured, and the city's been fully insured all this time, which means we paid $450,000 every single month for everyone that was on the plan. So it didn't matter if we had $5,000 in claims, $10,000 in claims, that's all irrelevant. It was a flat payment, basically. So going self-insured, you pay on the claims that actually come in. So it's projected that in July we'll have very few claims that actually come in on the new plan because folks won't be able to go to the doctor yet. So we, those expenses will be lower in July. They'll start increasing more a little bit in August as folks go to the doctor. So if I go to the doctor and have a $5,000 claim, once it goes to the network, 
uh, the deductions apply, whatever, um, then we know we have to pay $4,000 for my claim, or the city does, then the city funds it directly. Um, so it's all really kind of seamless. The employee doesn't see it, but the benefit of going self-insured is, is just a huge savings in it. Is there a cap though in terms of someone has like a major? There is a cap. And so in, in this plan, we have a 1500, I'm sorry, a uh, $150,000 specific deductible. So if my claims, and I'm just using myself as an example, especially since I'm injured. <laughs> uh, but if I exceeded $150,000, then at that point, we would pay no more money. Our stop loss carrier or Aetna would continue to pay the rest. We also have an aggregate, um, an aggregate portion where if the city as a whole spends 6.7 million, for example, then the um, carrier absorbs all the rest. So that's how we have the protection. The stop loss deductible, which is individual specific, and then the aggregate um, totals. That's what keeps us safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so a little bit more on insurance. This light is running from the batteries. Sorry. is our dental life and long-term disability. That is pretty much remaining the same. Dental did decrease about $10,000, $12,000, but because of that $82,000 increase, the city is gonna keep that savings to help pay for that. Unfortunately, property and liability increased $112,345, which is 17%. That is a very large increase, but if you'll remember last year, we had a lot of claims. Unfortunately, that has not slowed down this year in our property and liability, so I don't know what that increase will look like for um, next fiscal year, but we are working very hard to keep that down. Our workers comp did decrease $29,420. So I feel like we've done a good job in explaining to employees when to use that, um, when not to use. And our pension actually went up the most at $353,913. So our employees will continue to pay 2%, um, and the city share increased to 23.26%. The next thing in expenses that is not fun to talk about these days is fuel. We have budgeted $4.20 per gallon for regular. This is one of those things that I think we will be coming back to you in no time saying we've got to increase it across the board. Um, diesel is $5 per gallon. It has been a very, very long time. I actually went back, I, don't know, I think about 10 years to look and see if we have ever budgeted lower than what we paid the highest amount for the fiscal year prior and I could not find it. So this is very risky, um, but we didn't really have a choice to get this budget balanced. So we may be coming back sooner than the year to say we've got to have a fuel adjustment. What we've realized is that for about every nickel that we change it, there's a $24,000 change to the budget. So something that really is detrimental across the board doesn't have much effect when you look at it from that perspective. Um, so we could be back based on markets, based on forecasting, as y'all have seen the last couple of days, it's increased. So we like to have a little bit more of a cushion there and this year we do not. All right, so next one, expense highlights for our general fund. These are some of my favorite pictures, although Mr. Jacobs is not very happy with me. <laughs> In management services, our total increased 45,633. Your budget is proposed to increase 19,108. Mine increased 25,646, which is mainly due to the reclassification of the employee um, from administrative coordinator to executive assistant. Communications and public relations decreased $6,986. The staff attorney decreased $3,685. The city attorney by contract increased $22,150. 
And then of course, no one's term is up at the end of this year, so we do not have to hold an election in November. So elections decrease $10,600. Next year, you'll see it back in there for when everybody's term expires at the end of next year. Your particular expenses that are most notable would be Muni Code, of course. That is where we codify our ordinances online so that our community can see them. Education and training actually increased a good bit to $15,000. Uh, fireworks are at $12,000. The UGA Griffin payment that we make every year is at seventeen five. dollars Our archway payment is $20,000. And of course, we always keep $100,000 in contingency money for you all. Um, last year, a lot of that was used in our annex, or our uh, redistricting, I'm sorry, and apportionment, um, and the costs that we had associated with that. So we always like to have a little bit of money in there for you all. Municipal court, this is a big change this year as well. Um, our expense increased $52,657. What this does is add five additional court sessions per month. If you get a citation today, you're coming to court in November. What that does to your court calendar is really make a lot of people not care to show up. Either they've forgotten or they don't think it's a big deal anymore because that was seven months ago. I really don't care what they do to me now. Um, so we have a lot of failure to appear. So we're not able to get people in court to get citations handled. And so we're going to be adding court sessions to get that sort of back down where we don't have that much time between citation and court date. Uh, this also is an additional session for our school safety cameras. So you see that the professional services increased $30,000 for the judge, but the legal services actually only increased $14,400. That's because Mr. Eisen, our solicitor, is not needed for the school safety cameras and is not needed for code enforcement. So Ms. Cardin is handling that for us. We don't think we're going to need an attorney for our school safety cameras, so he is not having to increase his time with us as much, which is why his is less. Any questions about those? That's also why we see a little bit of an increase in revenue in municipal court. We do expect that with more court sessions, obviously there's more tickets that'll be disposed of. In administrative services, our expense increased $636,819. Uh, that sounds like a lot, it is a lot, but in FY22, it actually increased over a million. A lot of that is directly related to software and the amount of things that are now done through technological advances. Our director increased 43,873. That is where our open both software is paid for. So that's the majority of that increase. Accounting increased 12,917. Again, that's some of those staffing changes. Procurement um, increased 4,697. So just negligible there. IT, of course, increased 497,873. That's directly related to the software, hardware, those things that we need to be able to operate these days. And FY22 increased almost a million dollars, so down a little bit from last year. HR increased 67,376. They are finally going to replace their 2004, five Crown Vic. So that is what that is. They need a new car, it has blown up, so they can't go any further with that one. And then risk management increased $10,080, which is somewhat of a miracle since we have over $100,000 increase in our um, property and liability insurance. Next is public safety. And if you haven't seen that picture on the left, this was a push-up contest between a police officer and one of our uh, citizens one night. So I thought that was pretty cool that they did that. Their expense for police increased $657,728. A lot of that is vehicle replacements like we do every year. Fortunately, this year we were able to budget for seven. Uh, because we can buy four more now. And so we had 11 in the budget, but since we can go ahead and use some unexpended salaries, um, we are gonna go ahead and purchase four. It's actually on the agenda for tonight for y'all to approve this year, but that will sort of count as life cycle for next year. We are going back to dash cameras as well. So we have lens lock body cameras, we'll have our LPR cameras and then dash cameras. So that total for all of those cameras is $153,300 for the year. And body armor replacement, 19,500. A couple other in, uh, expenses in police. We have SWAT here at 10,500. Our training facility is at 23,648. And inmate custody, we're gonna do like we did this past year. Any money that is unexpended from FY22, we will roll over into 23. So we've only budgeted $50,000 with the COVID issues that still are ongoing and bail reform with not keeping anybody in jail. 
um, unless it's a felony or aggravated misdemeanor charge, they don't hold our our municipal court failure to appears or really probation violations very long, if at all. Um, so fortunately, that means we don't have to pay a lot of money in jail fees, but unfortunately, that means we have a hard time getting people to come back to court if they're not sitting there until their next court date. So there's some good and bad with that expense decreasing. In fire, their expense for 23 is proposed to increase $298,903. That is made up of turnout gear, 15 sets of turnout gear this year of $53,700. If you'll remember, every other year we have to do NFPA physicals, so those are budgeted at $27,900 department-wide. Uh, the chief is in need of a new vehicle. He's going to pass his along, and he will get something else, so that's budgeted at $44,800. And then their repair and maintenance services has increased $15,000 because their fleet continues to age, so we're also looking at ideas to get some um, replacements for fire. As I mentioned earlier, Public Works has increased probably the most drastically in general fund with a $1.284 million increase. The director increased $171,321, mainly due to the new operations manager position. And of course, that person will have to have a vehicle because the whole point is to get them in the field, to have a little succession planning for the director in that role. Our street department increased $1,140,163. The capital in the street department is $812,500. That consists of $80,500 each for three crew pickup trucks. Today, they go into the shop and don't know if it'll crank or not, so they've got to be replaced. A boom lift and trailer for $75,200. Right now, we rent that, and it's not very economically feasible to continue to do that as much as we're doing downtown with lights and banners and other things that the street department handles. And using an electric um, boom lift and truck is just also not very economically feasible. So we're getting, um, we're proposing to have the public works department purchase their own. They also have asked for an excavator at $75,300, a wheel loader at $191,500, and a tandem dump truck at $205,000. Those three things are mostly used for demolition. So the more that we tear down, also great, but the more that we run out that equipment. So that's what those three are budgeted for. Additionally, in the public works department, the pool, uh, again, it's just minimal utilities and insurance. I hope within the next month to two months, we will have a better understanding from our service delivery strategy negotiations as to where that is going. Um, parks has increased 15,316. Mostly they need a new deck mower, so that's budgeted $12,000. The cemetery decreased 83,309. They don't have any capital this year. And then facilities increased $63,266. Um, they are in need of a new pickup truck. So there's $35,000 for that capital purchase. Public Works now also houses the Welcome Center since they have facilities. So the operational cost for the Welcome Center is now $95,241, $47,229 of which is allocated to the archives since they are upstairs in that building. Uh, that did increase almost $8,000 from $39,690 in 22. Uh, we actually split the allocation from the archives 50-50 with the county. So each of us will be paying $23,614.50 for that Welcome Center allocation. The archives total budget is 144,515 and FY22 is 131,567. So the split this year 50-50 is 72,257.50 between the city and the county. She did ask for a little bit more um, shelving in the archives because she's getting some more stuff. So that's good news too. Development services, their expenses increased 296,252. Uh, the land bank property maintenance and operations, we budgeted the same as last year. As you all know, we are without an executive director and undergoing some review by a consultant right now. Uh, so we don't really know what that operational uh, expense may be. That again is split 50-50 with the county. So the total ends up being 38 7 times 2. Um, but we may see a change there. We hope that in some of our negotiations in the contract that we're trying to do for property maintenance, we may be able to decrease that while maybe having to increase the cost of operations. So that's something that we may have to come back to you as well uh, once the consultant finishes um, their recommendation. 
comprehensive plan is due next year. So we have $100,000 budgeted in this fiscal year. Um, it's going to be about a $200,000 project. So there will be $100,000 budgeted next year as well. But the way that the timing falls, we'll be able to sort of split that out instead of having to um, budget for all 200000 this year. We are going to use a private consultant. We'd like to bid that service out. We think it's important enough and has not been done that way um, in a few updates. So I think watching what the county is doing with their steering committee and comp plan uh, with Blue Cypress, we feel like that's something that we need to look in at as well. Our building inspections with Charles Abbott is at 339150 This is the expense. Um, and FY22, it was 242550 Of course, there's revenue associated with that, and that did increase as well. I think that may be in the next slide. And then we have reinstated the fourth code enforcement officer. If you'll remember, we went to two as fully certified, post-certified uh, code enforcement officers and never could fill that, that fourth position. Even with the increase in salaries that we did for PD last year, we did include those two code enforcement officer positions. So Mr. Jacobs and I have talked and we have decided to move that back to a regular code enforcement non-post certified officer. We think that that one uh, post certified officer is enough that we need to be able to come out if needed um, for a code enforcement issue that may turn a little bit more criminal in nature. Um, so we're going to reinstate that one without it being post-certified, which saves a little money there. Uh, Development Services does not have any capital this year. As we do every year, we budgeted $10,000 for our CDBG application uh, for possible CDBG and FY23. Transportation is a big change this year. This is our payment to Three Rivers. Um, it increased $63,350 because we are now considered uh, sort of a hybrid of the 5307 and 5311 transit program. What that means is we're not just classified as rural anymore because of our new census counts. We also have some urban areas. So unfortunately that costs us a little bit more money in um, being able to pay for that transit. So that went up drastically. Uh, the revenue associated with the inspections that I mentioned in the last slide from Charles Abbott is $465,500. Last year it was $408,500. You can see the increase in revenue just as you did in expense. Economic development, the expenses in that department have increased $63,354. Uh, we made the change from the part-time administrative assistant in March to full-time administrative assistant. Of course, that now comes with benefits, so not just an, an hourly rate change, but also a benefit uh, that we have to budget for. And then Historic City Hall facilities actually went down. It's now at 51,775 compared to last year at 66,110. We have a little bit more historical data as we continue to go with Historic City Hall, so we're able to um, better budget for utilities. For example, electricity, actually, we budgeted down $6,200, so that building is actually pretty energy sufficient, which is nice. Um, revenue, we have budgeted more for at $20,000. In FY22, we budgeted fourteen four. The more that we sort of find our new normal, the more we're seeing it rented. So we think that $20,000 is pretty conservatively estimated, and we hope that we'll see a lot more revenue from that. At that point, that concludes our general fund expense highlights. Let me have any questions for you to enterprise. All right, so our enterprise funds will start with our electric department. The revenues in that department, we are projecting to increase $1,240,250. Residential service increased $300,000. This is mostly because of new housing starts. Commercial service, we have projected to be about flat. Industrial service is projected to increase $667,750. Our power cost adjustment and our environmental compliance cost recovery uh, numbers are expected to decrease $92,900. Our all system sales just increased $155,000 and our delinquent penalties are budgeted as flat as well. If you'll remember, we do have contracts for third party sales to three different cities in Alabama and those total for this year's budget $1,063,290. The expenses though increased $2,412,120. Again, land maintenance and improvements is at $400,000. System protection is at $150,000. They need two F-350s at $132,000. Their new customer construction is $300,000. 
LED conversion for street lights is at 200,000. I hope that y'all have noticed those around town. I certainly have. They are a lot brighter um, and look much better as we continue to increase the number of street lights that we have as well. Uh, we have budgeted $50,000 for downtown parking lot lighting. We've had some complaints about some dark areas downtown, so we'll be looking at that. Automated switching that we always have budgeted is $100,000. Thousand dollars, and then of course utility relocations for anything that may pop up there too is budgeted at fifty thousand dollars. Additionally, their capital this year is totaled at one million six hundred sixteen thousand two hundred and six dollars. Their transfer to the general fund is about eighty thousand dollars higher than last year, so that makes it eight million seven hundred ninety-six thousand dollars compared to eight million seven hundred twelve thousand four hundred forty. That's just a direct reflection of their increase in revenue. And then their reserve earnings are $549,437 for FY23. Wastewater revenue has increased $1,089,994, but our expenses again have increased $1,509,376. Um, one thing to note here, if you're looking at this in whatever fashion that may be, either through our new little charts or through um, OpenGov itself, we have changed how we budget for depreciation. So I had to remove the numbers from last year's budget to be able to compare apples to apples as closely as possible. Um, otherwise, it looks like everything decreased and that's actually not the case. So if you look at it outside of this slide, it may look a little bit different than what it is to be able to compare it um, as close as possible. So the Shoal Creek actually went up $200,255. Potato Creek, we have budgeted an increase of 98,786. Cabin Creek is up $116,244. Blanton Mill is up 30,631. And the lift stations are up 48,109. Most of that is just in the cost of supplies increasing so dramatically for us. So that's what those are. And then additionally, our wastewater collections is up 522,404. And sludge management, which is our newest division within that department as of last year, is up 130,546. Our total wastewater capital this year is well down at $267,000 compared to $831,050 last year. This year, they have asked for an influent pump at 41,000, an EQ basin, uh, sorry, basin pump at 30,000, an autoclave sterilizer at 20,000, our renewals and extensions that we always have to try and increase our lines and capacities at 50,000, and then a side mount mower attachment at 45,000. Our water department saw a large increase in revenue at 2,987,153 which we'll talk about why in a second. Our residential increased 179,501. Commercial is projected to decrease at 71,739. Our industrial institutional rate is projected to increase at 95,761. And the biggest increase is in our wholesale, excluding Spalding County, that increases at 2,586,690, 2,580,000 of that being Cowita. So they now are required that to take that 5 million gallons a day, regardless of whether or not they use it, and that's that big, huge jump. Um, Spalding did increase slightly, uh, but we're not anticipating any kind of changes um, from them at this time. Additionally, the water expenses increased 1,604,266. The director has increased 421,214. A lot of that is in professional services, both technologically and in contractual relationships. Still Branch has increased 67,524. Perry Simmons increased 157,280. Water distribution increased 785,202. And as you see, their supplies are the main thing that is up 668,750. Their capital is not all that much. They have renewals and extensions at 50,000, a dump truck at 75,000, and a tow behind compressor at 19. So it's all those supplies that they have to use and pipes and concrete and all of that that has gone up so drastically. Again, this is comparing it to FY22 by removing the depreciation from 22. Otherwise, everything looks like it decreased and it really has not. Our water debt is always a big thing to talk about. Our debt service total for water wastewater is 7,321,430. Reservoir bonds are at 4.339 million. 
or the pump station GIF alone is at 319,640. Our Potato Creek wastewater treatment plant GIF alone is at 541,460. Our Cabin Creek wastewater treatment plant GIF alone is at 788,810. And our Still Branch generators are still at 123,460. Um, of course, when we refunded those bonds, we did have some savings there, but not too much that is shown in this regard. Our total water capital for FI23 is proposed at 239,000. Total, wa total wastewater capital is projected at 267,000. So in all, that's $506,000. Of course, they are um, capped at a $1.8 million <coughs> transfer by ordinance. So they will reserve $1,849,654 for FY23. Where are we at on the um, spillway repair? That's That hasn't been funded. Well, we, you did market. approve the mo third modification to the chief alone at your last meeting, I think that was. Um, so we're up to $14 million and we thought it would be about six to seven. So it's almost doubled in cost. Uh, Mr. Lewis is working with the contractor now on a contract that we'll bring back before y'all with the notice to proceed and we'll get started, but we're not, I think we're still negotiating contract. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, we're expecting to have it in Drew's hands for review and on the meeting for the board. Mm -hmm. Stormwater revenue and stormwater is expected to increase $139,243. Our expenses again decreased $227,456. The notable capital expenses there is a new pickup truck at $38,000 and a water quality meter at $10,900. The total capital of that department is quite small $48,900. Our debt service for principal and interest is $343,360. And they will restrict 398,518. We do not make a transfer from stormwater into general funds. So that all remains in the stormwater department. Solid waste. Their revenue this year increased one million. Is projected to increase one million seven hundred three thousand dollars five hundred sixty-two. Um, that makes it for the first time since I think Mr. Schwab has been here in 2007 over $10 million in revenue. That's a huge accomplishment at this point compared to just a few short years ago we were at about six. So we've made a big, big um, strides in the solid waste department to actually make that a viable business. So that does mean this year that revenues exceed expenses. That did not happen um, last year. So we're looking at $181,220 that will be restricted. Those are for our capital surcharges. Um, and landfill closure surcharges, so that will remain within solid waste. Those revenue uh, increases are expected in residential collections at $507,000. Again, more customers. Um, we're expanding into the county as much as we can. Our commercial collections, we expect to increase $81,500 through our marketing uh, campaign that we're doing with solid waste. And our yard waste collections, again, are a direct reflection of number of houses. That's $41,700 increase. Of course, the expense to the contractor also increased there. Transfer station, we're expecting an increase of $180,000. Our roll-off fees, again, through a big marketing campaign, we expect to increase $50, $53,050. And our landfill hat shows the biggest projected increase at $771,382. This was right before our fire at the landfill where the shredder caught on fire. We are hoping to have that insurance check in hand soon to be able to buy a new one. But that is a direct reflection of that being able to compact a lot more and put a lot more in that landfill. So we'll need to get that back pretty quickly to make sure we meet that projection. One thing to note, as of today, we did not budget anything in recycling because we are still negotiating through those contracts. If you'll remember, I think two meetings ago, you approved the cancellation of the Sudoku contract. As we sort of expected, they reached out to us almost immediately once they got a notification. We're not happy, want to know how they can work with us and make it a profitable business for us and for them, which we have not been able to even have any kind of conversation about. So that was um, helpful, I hope. But we've also been talking with Amwaste, American Fiber, and Carolina Recycling. Ms. Carden and Mr. Ennis have worked very well with them, and we hope to see a contract from them soon that would not only um, pay for our baler or for our, the use of the baler, but also give us a profit every month. 
Um, but because we don't have a contract in hand and everybody's is quite different in what they are proposing, it was too uncertain to budget at this time. Again, of course, the fire at the recycling center does not help because we can't take anything right now. So we hope to be back with you in the next couple of months to amend the budget to show um, some kind of revenue in the recycling because that program is not going away. We want to make sure that that still exists. It's just that right now we don't know the best way to project revenue, so it's at zero. The expenses in solid waste also increased, though. They're uh, $1,466,124 more than in FY22. A couple of their notable purchases are a landfill ATV. We're starting to move back to the new expanded landfill, and you can't get there in a truck. So they're going to have to have an ATV to be able to get back there and start doing some work back there. So that's $13,387. They have budgeted for 28 eight-yard dumpsters at $43,200. Residential carts, of course, more houses, more carts. So 600 trash and 400 recycling are $61,000. If you have an old trash can now, you can tell it. And we're having a lot of them having to be replaced or at least repaired. So that's we don't expect 600 new housing starts, but we do expect to have to continue to replace those carts more frequently as the years go on. And then the yard waste contract, of course, increased because of the amount of houses that are increasing. So that's an increase of 40630 the biggest increase in solid waste is across the department is in their fuel. Their budget total is $705,670. That's up $347,000 just in fuel. So that's almost 100% increase for fuel in that department. There's nothing you can do. The only way you can get trash is to drive to it. So, um, you know, we're doing the best we can to sort of monitor that, make sure that their um, preventive maintenance is on the schedule. Um, but that's just a lot of money and a lot of gas for them. So hopefully we can keep it as much in check as possible. Jim, there, I'm sorry. It's mostly um, gasoline or is it? It's diesel? mostly diesel. And then at the landfill, they have bulk delivery of that as well, which actually is more expensive. It is a little bit more expensive. Which makes no sense to me, but it, it is. So, um, yeah, they have a lot of different, and I think they have bulk delivery at the transfer station too. Yep. So at our two fixed locations, they have bulk delivery and they're using diesel um, on the road. So it's a big expense. Their total capital this year though is only the ATV. So 13,387, if you'll remember um, in FY22, they were the big sort of needed to make up for no capital purchases. So they were at $1,089,180 last year. Um, there's some transportation projects that they have requested in the budget that we were able to move out and we're going to use some excess floss funds for some paving at the landfill, which will be very helpful even with the expansion of the landfill and paving at the transfer station. Um, both of those things meet transportation requirements and so we'll be doing that through that excess floss funds. Airport. Our total revenues there are $1,657,057, which does include transfers. Operating revenue at the airport is $631,789. Spalding County operations are $139,569. Spalding County debt service is $366,590. If you'll remember back four years ago, five years ago, when we started paying back bond, um, debt service, they were not able to do that, so we paid their portion for them. Now they're having to make up for that, so they're paying $335,565 for the current fiscal year debt service, but they're also paying $31,025 to make up for those prior years that we paid for them. And then the transfer that we are having to make from the general fund as the city to them is $445,984, which is down. Um, last year it was $528,198, so we are projecting to be able to have a lesser transfer from the general fund to the airport. Their expenses are at 910,927. The debt service, again, like I just mentioned for the city is 335,565, which is $257,500 in principal, $78,065 in interest. They do have a grant project this year at the existing airport. This is for the design phase only of payment rehabilitation and remarking. It is a $75,000 cost for the, for the design phase. The FAA is going to pay $67,500. GDOT will pay $4,750. And the city and county will each pay $1,875. So interesting to continue to do work out there, but it's needed if we're going to continue to operate there until the new airport is done and it's not at much of a cost to us. 
Telecom operating revenue has increased there 68,630, which gives them the total revenue of just over a million this year, $1,014,130. Uh, 507,620 comes from fiber leases. Last year it was 438,800, so you see an increase there with our expansion. And then we do have internal service charges for telecom because we are a customer um, as the city. So 506,510 are internal service charges, which is also an increase from 456,700 and just for your 22. Their expenses are $904,038. Uh, most of that comes in the new position. So 209,363 in the telecom support specialist and telecom systems engineer. There's a $60,000 professional services budget for the consulting that we use with the fiber expansion, and then $35,000 for a new vehicle for those positions. There's $86,000 in operating supplies, and the internet that we purchased from Georgia Public Web to resale is $220,000. Golf course revenue is at $508,600. That's operating revenue for the transfer in FY21. It was at 361,550, so that's an increase of 147,050, which is almost 40% or over 40%. The expenses are at 1,113,805 though, which is a 22% increase in expenses of 205,633. They do have some capital purchases at the golf course this year, a tractor at $42,000, the fairway air fire at 9,500, pond aerator at $10,000 and then additional irrigation at 10,000. You look at that picture up there, you can see exactly why we want to continue to add irrigation to the course because it looks great and they're doing a great job out there. So the transfer unfortunately did go up this year because of the increase in expenses. Again, their most um, expense increase was fuel. So the total budgeted is 50,720 this year compared to 18,100 and FY22, they also have bulk delivery of fuel. So that increase is over $50,000 um, for the transfer that is needed from the general fund. Motor pool, operating revenue there is $1,081,705 and FY22 is at 956,100. The expenses are at 1628495 and FY22 was at 1568878 so this did drop just a little bit. Capital for the motor pool is a pickup truck at $35,000, and then they have two different diagnostic systems for the uh, vehicles and equipment that come in there that are budgeted at $15,600. The transfer that is needed from the general fund is $546,790, which is actually a decrease from last year. So golf course went up a little bit, but uh, motor pool made up for that and um, went down almost over $100,000 from $659,538. A little bit more in regards to economic development. Their total expense is at $385,642. That consists of $333,642 specific to economic development and then the $51,775 from Historic City Hall. Um, the DDA is at $120,887, which is a $27,910 increase from FY22. $109,405 is an allocation out of economic development, and $11,482 is specific to DBA. Main Street's budget is at $129,688, which is a $23,971 increase from last year. The allocation is again $109,405, and then $20,283 is specific to Main Street. The economic development's budget in and continues to increase, um, but I think that's good. That means hopefully we're getting some more um, developers in, some more interest in the city, so we need some more help there. So at FY22, the budget was 255,953, so almost $100,000 increase there. Hotel motel tax has also increased. In FY22, we budgeted $120,000. This year, we budgeted $164,300. I think people now knowing that we have our new Holiday Inn Express, um, and then of course with COVID restrictions sort of lifting, conferences are back. Um, so a lot of people are using that to stay if they're coming into town for a sporting event, a conference or anything like that. So 164,300 is budgeted there with a 18.75% um, specific to Historic City Hall, which equals 30,806. 
GSBTA will receive the bulk of that as our destination marketing organization at 71881 and then the general fund is able to keep 37.5%, which is 61613 We have a few special revenue funds last to touch on CDBG. Uh, we've budgeted $1,552,781. We hope to receive that million dollar grant that we've been getting for several years now, but our local match has gone up to $552,781. Our court technology fee or fund is something that is restricted just for the use of court technology. Uh, we expect $25,000 in revenue there. SPLOST, of course, collections have ended, so we don't have any revenue budgeted for our 2016 SPLOST. Um, those, those collections ended in April, but we do still have expense, so that expense is held in fund balance right now for SPLOST. So $1,927,800 will be paid for our debt service on the bonds, $300,000, of course, for blight, and then $2,367,800 for transportation. Finally, our TSPLOS Special Revenue Fund, we do expect $3,727,500 in collections for this fiscal year. Um, those last couple lines, the SPLOS expenses and the TSPLOS Revenue and Expenses, we expect once we got through budget, we need to sit down and figure out where we're going with those projects, what's gonna start when, get those sort of prioritized and in line and budgeted, possibly bid out. Um, so we'll be back with you pretty soon about what those exact expenses will be um, and for what and when. Is that what we decide from now what we forecast our revenues to be? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that shouldn't change. All right. I think that might be a record for getting through budget. Yeah. Any questions, <laughs> comments, concerns, changes that need to be made before tonight or June 14th? I think it's exceptional considering um, the new system and everything else I've had to work for it, um, new faces, and so um, it's commendable the accomplishment. I personally don't have any concerns other than we keep watching fuel costs and personnel issues and, and um, how we as an organization will continue to provide the service that the citizens expect in the service. I want to express my appreciation. Uh, I went back <clears throat> and looked over the budget with Ms. Uh, O'Connor for answering any concerns that I may have. So thank you so much. That's right. I did have one citizen come back. Thank you. It's more fun than just a little clip art. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Nothing else. Motion that we going to executive session pursuant to CGA section 5014 for the purpose of consulting and meeting with legal counsel pertaining to pending and potential litigation, settlement, claims, administrative proceedings, and other judicial actions brought or to be brought by or officer or employee or which agency or any officer or employee may be directly involved. This report may motion with a second. second. Mrs. Murray made a second. All in favor, please join us in the house.